at. Well, in 2013, there was a man, a 30-year-old man, in fact, by the name of Henry Gribholm, came from Epson, New Hampshire, and, and, and this man filed a police report after claiming that he had lost over $2,600 on a carnival game called Tubs of Fun. How many of you have been to a carnival before? Yeah? How many of you have tried that Tubs of Fun game before? We might, oh, we don't, that's a picture ahead, but that's okay. Um, and so, so he, he had this game that he wanted to do well at, and he kept trying. And Tubs of Fun is $5, and you get two balls, and you got to throw it. It's got that, that big peach basket mounted on the wall, and if you don't hit it just perfectly right and roll it in, the ball falls to the ground, and it doesn't count, and you don't win a prize. And so they give you these plastic balls, and you got to throw them in this tilted bucket. And, and Henry's goal, he wanted to win an Xbox for his kids. But after he had spent the $300 he had on him on the game without any sort of success, he went home and, and, and grabbed another $2,300 apparently out of his sock drawer, and all of the money he had in the whole wide world apparently, and returned to the carnival the next day uh, after spending all $2,600 on this game. He returned to the carnival complaining that he was unable to win this Xbox after $2,600 of expense. And so in sympathy, the game operator gave him $600 back and a large stuffed banana with a hat and dreadlocks, as you saw in the picture a little bit a moment ago. Yeah, he got, he got one of those as a consolation prize for $2,600, right? Um, but, but how many people, how many people know sometimes we can want something just a little too much, right? We want something just a little too bad, don't we? And we're starting a brand new series today where we're going to be looking at for a few weeks obedience. And the series is called, I Want What God Wants. Now here's the truth. You only like the word obey if you are a parent, right? Moms, you like the word obey, don't you? Dads, obey. You like that word. If you're not a parent, you don't like that word. Nobody else likes that word, just parents. The reason, the reason the word obey even exist is because someone had to create a word to convince someone to do something they didn't want to do, right? When somebody sends me a text message and says, hey, let's go for a motorcycle ride, right? I'm not obeying him when I say yes. I already want to go, right? When somebody, one of my friends calls me and says, hey, meet us at Buffalo Wild Wings. I'm not obeying when I show up and chow down on some wings, right? I wanted to be there. That's not obey. Obedience is a choice I make when I don't want to do something. You see, I have to obey that officer who says, slow down or you're going to get a ticket, right? I have to obey the doctor who says, take this or you won't get well. I have to obey the government when they say, pay your taxes or go to jail, right? I even, I have to obey my wife. No, really, I do. And not just on Mother's Day for that matter, but, but you get the idea, right? Even, even all of the, uh, so to speak, rule followers in the room here, some people are more rule followers than others. It's kind of a spectrum, right? But some people, I mean, you just, you got to follow the rules. And if you have a... Uh, a preteen child, you know, that, that 9, 10, 11 year old span there, um, they really are rule followers if you know kind of that developmental stage, right? And, and, and even if you're in that category, even at your core, if you're a rule follower, you don't always like having to obey. You don't always like having to do something that you don't want to do. I was watching a, a TV show a few years ago. And, and they, were, they were interviewing these young, they were, you know, probably preschool and early elementary age children. And they were asking these young kids, little boys and little girls, and they were just cute and adorable, as they always are, of course. And they were asking these children, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? And, and so the newscaster would, would say, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And eh, stick the mic in their little faces. And, oh, I, I, I would like to be a football player, Right? So you had lots of football players and some firemen, you know, various athletes and, 
And there, there was one girl who wanted to, to raise ponies, and there was a princess in that group, right? Uh, and then there was a president. One kid wanted to be president. I bless his heart. I don't know why, but he wanted to be president. And, and then finally they get towards the end, and they've gone through just, I don't know if it was a class or what it was, but it's a bunch of kids. And they get to this last one, and this last girl, she's just precocious. And she's just this little freckled, cute, little redheaded kid. And, 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 and the newscaster's bent down on one knee and is talking to her and says, Hey, when you grow up, what do you, what do you want to be? And, and you can kind of see she scrunches up her face a little bit and she thinks about it for a little minute. And she reaches out and she grabs a mic and drinks it and sticks it in her face and she says, I want to be in charge! <laughs> right? How many of you thought when you were going to get to be an adult, you'd never have to do anything again that you didn't want to do? Anyone else? <laughs> right? Right? Now over the last several years, God has taken me on a journey of, of self-examination and discovery to, to help me answer this question. Do I really want what God wants for my life? Do I really want what God wants for my life? Initially, this seems like a simple question, right? And when I think about all the things that, that God would want for me, I, I, I kind of get a little excited, of course. I mean, God, God wants my life to be blessed and filled with joy, right? He wants to have this close, personal, intimate relationship with me. Uh, God, God wants my family. God wants my career to thrive and flourish. I mean, who wouldn't want those sorts of things, right? Now, God and I can, can agree on all of those things. But it's never the ends that are the problem. It's the means to get me there that can be a problem. There is no doubt whatsoever that, that God wants my life to be blessed and to be joyful. There's no doubt that He wants to have this great relationship with me and, and He wants all these things where I might flourish and do well and He'll bless me. But you see, God and I tend to disagree and, and wrestle with one another about how He is going to make all of that happen in my life. And I'm learning, and I'm a little thick skulled so I'm a bit slower than some of you, but I'm learning that my plan and God's plan to get me where He wants to take me are rarely the same path. Let me give you a couple examples, right? I want to learn how to handle more money by having more money. God wants me to learn how to handle more money by faithfully managing what little He gives well. I want my spouse, my family, and all of my friends to change so that I could love them more. God, He wants me to change so that I can love people who are sometimes difficult to love. I want God to answer all of my prayers so that my faith could grow and be strong, right? God, God wants me to endure through tough times so that my faith can grow. You see, most of the time, God and I can agree on where I'm going but it seems almost like we always disagree on just how it is I'm going to get there. So for this first week of this sermon series, I want us to answer just one question. The answer to this question is foundational for your faith. Being able to say yes to this question is the launching pad for being able to want what God wants for your life, no matter what. And that question is, do I trust God always wants what's best for me? Do I trust that God always wants what's best for me? I want you to think about that right now. Do you believe that, that God actually wants, always wants what's best for you? We find a number of, of verses in, in the Bible describing just how big and how great God's plans are for our lives. We got Hannah's favorite verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, right? 
For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Or how about John 10.10? 10? John 10.10 10 reminds us that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I, says the Lord, I came that they may have life and have life abundant. But it's, it's really difficult to believe that to believe those things when, when God, it seems like, is, is keeping us from what we want or, or when the Holy Spirit is asking us to do something we don't want to do because we're convinced our way is better, right? When God asks me to, to forgive someone who has hurt me deeply, can I trust in that moment that He wants what is best for me? When, when, when God asks me not to, to play house with someone I'm not married to, can I trust that He wants what's best for me? When God asks me to give with joy and give with generosity of my time, my treasure, my talents, can I trust that He wants what's best for me? Now, I don't want to leave anyone in suspense today. The answer to that is yes. Every single time that God puts something in your life, he wants what is best for you. Even when it doesn't seem like it sometimes. And in order for us to get to a place where we can honestly say, I want what God wants, we have to come to terms with this truth. Anytime, literally anytime, anytime that I disagree with God, I'm wrong. Because He knows what I need, and He knows what is best for me. You might want to write that down. I think that's an important thought. See, the, the struggle to trust that God knows best, and to believe that He wants the best for us, this, this problem goes back to ancient times. It's not something that's new. This goes back all the way back to the beginning of your Bibles. If you want to follow along, open up to Genesis 2. You see, Adam and Eve, they hadn't been together for very long at this point, And they chose what they wanted instead of what God wanted, right? We can read this famous story in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. You might see them here on the screen here. Genesis 2, 8-9, it says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden and in the east, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant in the sight and is good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was there as well. And then in Genesis 2, 15 through 17, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in this entire garden, with one lone exception, of course, but of that tree of knowledge and good and evil. You shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, then you shall surely die. And if we skip ahead to Genesis 3, 1 through 6, it tells us, now the serpent, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he too ate it. This problem has been around for a long time. And you see, Satan will never stop trying to convince you that God's ways are irrelevant, that God's ways are old-fashioned or impossible or, or not practical, or that God's ways are just plain wrong. And when we find ourselves being tempted to struggle to obey God's way, we have to remember that God always wants what's best for me. Of course, I'm learning this in my own life. And I would suggest it's true for you as well. 
You see, almost always, I am the worst person to decide what is best for me, right? In fact, I was present at every worst decision I ever made. <laughs> Think about that for a second. I mean, I, I'm almost always too impatient or short-sighted, right? Sometimes, many times, most of the time, I don't know, you can judge. Uh, I'm selfish, right? And I'm selfish, and I, and, I, and I want to make the best decision for my life, and I think I know what's best. But let's be honest, I'm an idiot. I don't. I don't know what's best. I'm a fool. Slowly, slowly, as I grow spiritually, as I mature, awfully slowly, I'm learning, though, to listen, to trust the voice of the Holy Spirit more in my life. Not to mention to trust my wife's intuition at the same time as well, because she's often that voice of the Holy Spirit, right? Good thing she's in my life. Don't misunderstand what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about codependency. I'm not saying that you need a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or an overprotective parent to help you make your decisions for you, right? Because you're not smart enough to do it on your own. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about where, where God is wanting to take me. About what He wants to do in my life. God's incredible plans for my life will almost certainly take longer and they will also be harder than what I would really desire for myself. Than what I would think they might possibly even be. <coughs> but if I will trust that He always wants what's best for me, even at those moments where it doesn't seem like it, and if I will trust even in those little areas of obedience where sometimes I think it might not matter, I can trust that God can do great things. Much greater than I ever could if I had it my way. How many of you have ever eaten at the Christian chicken joint called Chick-fil-A, right? That's true at Kathy on the screen. He's a founder of Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, oh, man, I just... It's like delicious. I don't know. I can't even. If you've not had Chick fil A, find a Chick fil A and repent. Okay? It's good. It's good Christian chicken. Christian chicken. They don't, they don't, they're not open on Sundays. I'm serious. They refuse to serve on Sundays because the principles of their founder and their service will blow you away. Just wait. If they screw up your order, you will be astonished at how they make amends for making a mistake. They, they just, they're. Service in fast food is above and beyond any other restaurant far and away, with no question. And, and Chick-fil-A was founded, as I said, by Truett Cathy. And one of the things you should know, he, he used to, he, he loved cars. And he loved giving away cars, actually. Now, he was discipling a young man in faith. And it happened to be this young man needed a car. But in Truett's discernment, he needed discipling even more than he needed a car. So he and this young man, this is back in the day of cassette tapes, he and this young man agreed to listen to some preaching tapes that Truett had collected over the years that he thought were good, that he thought were worth the time of this young man to listen, that he thought might grow him and shepherd him and, and, and raise him up spiritually. And so, so Truett gave him this, this, this collection of, of tapes and, and said, listen to these and, and see what God does with it. Now, he had played a little trick on this young man at the same time. He had given them to him, to him and said, you need to listen to these in this order. And on the very last tape, instead of it actually being a sermon, it was the voice of Truett Cathy saying, after you've listened to all of these tapes, when you get to the end of this one that you're listening to now, come up to my office because I have keys to a new car for you. So the kid never listened to the tapes. You see, Truett Cathy kept reminding him kept encouraging him. Listen to the tape, son. But after a few months, he realized it just was never going to happen. And so Truett called this young man into the office and said, hey, bring all those cassette tapes I gave you with you. The young man comes in and 
said, uh, you still needing a car? Oh yeah, I just I can't afford a car. I really could use a car. It'd be a real blessing. Wish I had a car, but don't have a car. Uh, you know, kind of that kind of deal. And so Truett reached into that box and pulled out that last tape and stuck it into a cassette player on his desk. And there was his voice saying, come on up to my office when you listen to these tapes. I have keys to a brand new car for you. Now he didn't give the boy the car. He said it, it was one of the, the, the most difficult lessons he ever had to teach somebody in his entire life. And like the man in this story, during the, the mundane things in life, or even during the difficult or the tragic things in life, it's easy to think that there's, there's no point, or to think that, that God isn't up to something. But almost always, at the end of whatever lesson God is trying to teach me, I'm reminded again and again and again that God always wants what's best for me, and He's working in it for my good. Say that to the person next to you. God always wants what's best for me and is working in me for my good. Right? So what is the thing in your life that you're not sure you can trust God with? What is the thing in your life that you're not sure you can trust God with it, with about? What, what is it? What is it? Right? What is your unanswered prayer? Is it sickness? A new job? Trusting God with your children or your grandchildren? Finances? Taking a, a moral or an ethical stand that might cost you something in the short term? Or maybe put down your guard in a relationship to be the first one to step towards healing? Maybe making a decision to remove sin from your life? Uh, uh, maybe it's an addiction or it's a relationship or some sort of secret sin? Or maybe it's simply just to, to stand still and to wait for God. To wait on Him when everything in you wants to move forward already and fix it yourself. When you want to fix your own problem. As hard as it is to trust and obey God. If the Bible or the Holy Spirit is, is telling you to do something you don't want to do. You can trust that what God wants for your life is always best for you. Trust is a difference maker. You see, folks, trust makes or breaks a relationship. God always knows what's best for you. Let's pray.